Chapter 25, Thursday, April 24th, 1788. Even though the bullet wound in his left side was not yet entirely healed, and this raid into the Kentucky country had tired him more than he was willing to admit, Blue Jacket was pleased that he had come. None would have thought the worse of him had he elected to stay behind in his wigiwa. Even though the wound was healing well, with the drainage stopped and a scab well formed, it would not take much to break it loose again. He had received the wound three weeks ago as he stood high on a rocky outcrop on the Spele with Thipi upstream from the mouth of the Scioto River. There he had watched a large flatboat drift downstream in the swift current towards the young river town of Maysville. This was a good lookout point called Hanging Rock. From its top, a great vista of the Spele with Thipi could be seen in both directions. Blue Jacket was nearly a half mile from the boat and had even smiled at the little puffs of smoke which indicated the men had spotted him outlined against the sky and were firing at him. At such range and from a moving boat, they could not possibly expect to hit him. But then had come the tremendous blow in his side and the faint cheers from the men as he fell. He had quickly plugged this wound with buzzard down always. He had quickly plugged the wound with buzzard down always carried for such purposes and pulled himself onto his horse. He headed home, though he was somewhat foggy about most of the trip. He couldn't even remember falling from his horse just as he entered the village. Wabith had probed and found the bullet removed it and dressed her husband's wound. For four days a great fever had ridden him, but her care had been good and he recovered quickly. When he learned of the projected raid to get horses from across the Spele with Thipi, there was nothing else to do but take leadership of the party despite Wabith's protests. She had bound him tightly about the middle and begged him neither to move suddenly nor stretch nor engage in running or jumping, lest he tear open the wound and the red fire in the flesh which he knew as infection should attack and kill him. The night before they left, she had presented him with an unusual but beautiful gift, a special hat she had labored over during nearly all the time he had been convalescing, a hat which was a talisman to keep him safe from harm. Meticulously sewn together, it was a jet-black affair made of the feathers of crows over a skull-cap type of base. A thin band of rawhide held it securely under his chin. Partially extended wings down from the out, one from the other, each side, and tail feathers hung down from the rear. He accepted it gravely and told her he believed in its powers. What, what does convalescing Like sick, um, ill. He had worn it all the way into the Kentucky country as well as during the time the 15 of them had quietly stolen up in the dead of night to Strode Station. They had fed salt to the horses in the corral to quiet them and then had taken the 30 best ones and led them away without the whites even knowing they had been there. About noon, when they reached the Spele with Thipi near the mouth of Cabin Creek, five miles above Maysville, a cold, misty rain had begun falling. Feeling unreasonably secure from pursuit, he ordered that the horses be taken across and driven to their village. He would stay here to rest a few hours and then follow. Unwilling to leave their chief alone in his weakened condition, however, two of the warriors returned after the horses had been swum across and built a fire in a relatively dry spot beneath a huge tree and sat down with, it, with Blue Jacket. But the theft of the horses had been discovered within an hour, and a dozen men, led by Jasper Hood and John McIntyre, had taken up the trail. They were experienced trackers and Indian fighters, and the first that the three Shawnee knew of their approach was when shots rung out and one of their warriors slumped over dead. Instantly, Blue Jacket and his companion leapt to their feet and ran in opposite directions, but the warrior was cut down with a dozen steps. Jasper Hood, astride his horse, galloped after Blue Jacket. As he overtook him, he swung his rifle, and the barrel caught the chief alongside his head, stunning him. He managed to retain his footing, but realizing the hopelessness now of further attempting escape, surrendered. Within minutes, Blue Jacket's hands were tied securely behind him, and he was driven before the men, the rumpled crow feather hat still astride his head, though one wing was now dangling. They went first to Maysville and stayed at Boone's cabin one night. The work of his capture spread, and a continuous procession of visitors came to gawk and jeer at the feared Shawnee chief. His capture was something to boast of, and his presence something of a sideshow. With their captives securely tethered, they also stopped at Washington and Mays Lick, Millersburg, and Stockton Station. Finally, on the third night, they reached Strode Station again. Though the exertions had ripped open his side wound, Blue Jacket gave his captors no indication that he was in any way in pain. Weary from their own exertions, the men tied the prisoners to a post in one of the cabins, placed a guard over him, and retired to their own cabins to sleep before deciding what to do with him. Less than an hour later, the guard had fallen asleep too, and Blue Jacket wasted no time. 
He knew he could not free himself from the tight rawhide thongs which bound both his wrists and ankles, but he had expanded his chest as they bound him to the post, and now these cords were loose. Back and forth he leaned against the post, and gradually it loosened on the earth until he was about squat with it, using his chest thongs for leverage to raise the post out of the ground. Very quietly then, so as not to awaken his guard, he lay out stretched on the ground with the post and managed to slip the thongs off the pointed end. When he regained his feet, these thongs fell loosely to the ground. Now, ignoring the pain in his side, he began a series of short hops, each time landing silently on the balls of his feet and poising there for a moment before hopping again. He had decided to make a great bound and land with his knees in the guard's middle should he begin to awaken, but the guard never stirred and his faint snoring helped drown out any sound made by Blue Jacket's light hopping. The Shawnee chief raised the latch with his teeth and swung the door open with his shoulder, then hopped away into the darkness. The farther he got from the cabins, the greater his hops became, and he did not stop until he was deep in the woods. At length his lungs burst, were bursting and his injured side was a mass of pain, so he stopped and slumped to the ground. He found that he could just reach the uppermost ankle binding with his teeth, though the straining made the pain in his side agonizing. It took him nearly a half hour of alternately resting and chewing to gnaw through the cord, but at last it was done. He shook the cord away and with immense relief stretched his legs apart. The wrist bindings, however, were very tight and not even rubbing them against a sharp rock had much of an effect to tear uh, anything besides his own skin, nor could he afford to spend any more time in this vicinity. He set off at an easy lope and before daylight reached the scattering cabins which indicated Stockton Station. Crooning gently, he climbed the coral fence coral fence and stood poised there on the top rail until one of the milling horses came close enough and he leapt lightly astride its back. Startled, the horse partially reared for a moment, but Blue Jacket gripped tightly with his knees and continued his crooning chant. Gradually the horse settled down. With knee pressure he guided it to the gate and pushed off the top two bars with his foot. At an abrupt punch of his heels the horse leapt the last rail and Blue Jacket was on his way home. It took him four days, but he finally got there. Hungry, thirsty, feverish, and weak, and for the second time he collapsed and fell unconscious from a horse as he entered the village. But he was back home alive, and the lucky crow feathered hat, considerably the worse for wear, was still upon his head. Chapter 26, Saturday, October 30th, 1790. The last years had been ones of change. Though a few scattered families of the Shawnee still lived in the ruined towns along the Upper Mad and Great Miami River, the majority of the tribe had now moved to the regions of the Auglaise and Maumee Rivers in the northwestern portion of the Ohio country. Here their villages were reasonably safe from white attack, and yet they themselves could still continue to harass the whites in Kentucky and destroy boats coming down the Spelewithipi. Relations with the whites had degenerated rather than improved, and though their War of the Revolution was over, the British in Detroit still encouraged the harassment and provided the Indians with food, weapons, and gunpowder, and they still bought scalps. But now the settlement of Ohio had begun in earnest. The newly appointed governor of the territory, Arthur St. Clair, had begun to partition the Ohio territory into counties and new towns and forts were springing up. These towns were now firmly established on the north of the Ohio River, across from the mouth of the Licking River, North Bend, which was also called Sim City, Los Santiville, and Columbia. St. Clair, however, did not like the name Los Santiville and promptly had the town's name changed to Cincinnati. Here a very strong fort, impervious to Indian attack, had been built. It was named Fort Washington. With its war with Britain more or less settled, the fledgling government in the United States now had time to consider at greater depth the problem of the Western Indians. President George Washington authorized the sending of an army under General Josiah Harmar, Josiah Harmar on a punitive campaign against the Shawnee on the Auglaise and Maumee rivers. It was a strong army of 1,400 men equipped with good rifles, more than adequate supplies, and even some cannon. But it was an army with a severe weakness, a commander who had both, was both inept and cowardly. General Josiah Harmar was no longer the energetic and enterprising officer he had been during the Revolution. The army began its march north from Washington on October 7th, but the Indians learned of its advance and prepared themselves. Once again, the Shawnee combined into a loose confederacy made up of Shawnee, Delaware, Miami, Potawatomis, Potawatomis Ways, Wyandots, Pinkashaws, and a few Ottawa and Kickapoo. Two great warriors stood out as incomparable war chiefs, and unable to choose which of the two should have command, the Indians named them both as joint commanders. They were Little Turtle of the Miamis and Blue Jacket of the Shawnees. 
By late October, when Harmer's army reached the junction of St. Mary's and St. Joseph's rivers, where the Maumee River begins, the Indian force was ready and waiting. Harmer sent out two detachments of men to destroy Indian villages. One was successful, but the other was itself destroyed to the last man by a howling mass of warriors. Harmar panicked and ordered a full retreat, but his men um, were so incensed over this that they finally got him to stop some miles distant and send back a large detachment to find and bury the bodies of their comrades and perhaps engage the Indians. This group, too, made the mistake of dividing itself into three wings and becoming separated. Once again, the shrewd generalship of the two Indian commanders became evident when they decoyed one of the wings away and then swooped down and practically demolished the other two. At this, Harmar fled south to Fort Washington, leaving 109 of his men dead on the battlefield. It was one of the most shameful defeats in the young country's history, a defeat made even worse by the fact that, though the army was better armed and even had artillery, no more than a dozen Indians had been killed. The fame of Blue Jacket and Little Turtle spread across the land. Chapter 27, Wednesday, March 23rd, 1791. Although back again at the mouth of the Scioto River, Blue Jacket was still in an ugly mood as a result of the news he had heard before leaving his village. Two years ago, Chicxica and Tecumseh had journeyed south to the land of the Cherokee and stayed with them for a while, helping them in their own battles against the encroaching whites. Tecumseh had gone away a boy, but had returned a man. The stories of his incredible feats of daring and leadership and fierceness had preceded him. He had become a great warrior, and some were already saying that one day he would lead the Shawnee to victory over the whites. But this was what had deeply affected Blue Jack the most. Chicxica had not returned. A bullet from the whites had caught him directly between the eyes, killing him instantly. Blue Jacket's mood had not been improved by hearing from white captives he had taken from several boats in the Spaliwithipi that a new army was being formed to come again against the Indians. This army was to be led by none other than Governor Arthur Sinclair, and supposedly it would be a force against which no tribe, no confederacy could stand. At this, Blue Jacket smiled. How little the whites still knew of the fighting ability of the Indians. He decided he would remain here for a few more days with his 80 or more warriors. They would take five or six boats with scouts to report where, who was coming downstream. Then he could return to the Maumee Ma and report his findings to the other chiefs so that the Confederacy could be reformed again to teach the White Army a lesson. As a runner dashed up with word that the first of the boats would be coming into sight in a moment, Blue Jacket motioned his men into cover, when all men were turned to the two bedraggled white men sitting tied together on the shore. You know where we are hidden, he told them grimly as he cut away their bonds. Your lives hang on what you do now. If you draw the boat successfully to shore, you will live. If you fail to convince the men to land, you will die immediately. It is that simple. Do not try to escape or warn them, or you will die along with them. The men nodded, frightened, and got stiffly to their feet, rubbing their wrists with the rawhide that had dug into their flesh. Blue Jacket watched them for a moment, and then he too strode to the brush nearby and disappeared into it. Within five minutes, more of a large canoe appeared with 13 men and two women. It moved out from around a bend into plain view. It was far out in the current, but still much closer to the Kentucky side than to the Ohio shore. When it was four or five hundred yards distant, the two white men on shore began waving their arms and calling to the boat for help. The craft came a little closer to shore, but not much. It was obvious that the occupants had heard how some of the Indians had learned to don white men's clothes and to decoy boats ashore with memorized English words and phrases. The people in the boat had no intention of being so tricked. All 15 people aboard suddenly had rifles at ready, including even the two women. We've been prisoners of the engines, one of the pair on the shore shouted. We got away. You got to help us, please. You got to. The men in the bow shouted questions back at them. What were their names? When were they caught? Where? How did they get away? Where did they hail from? How could they prove they were not Indians trying to decoy them to shore? The men pleaded, answering all the questions. One identified himself as David Thomas, a frail and frightened looking man. The other was a tough appearing, bewhiskered individual who claimed his name was Peter Devine. As the two explained their capture, their escape, their origin, and other matters, it became evident they could not possibly be Indians, and the man in the bow of the canoe ordered the boat ashore. As it ground to a halt on the gravel, the leader jumped out and splashed ashore to tie a rope securely around a large chunk of driftwood. The shots came, just as he straightened, twenty or thirty of them at the same time. In that single instant, the lives of John May and his fourteen passengers were snuffed out. 
Instantly, following the volley at which Divine and Thomas had thrown themselves to the ground and cowered, Blue Jacket and his Meikuje and Kispokotha warriors emerged from the underbrush. Blue Jacket stopped at May's body, which was lying face down. As Divine and Thomas got to their feet, pale with fear, the Shawnee chief turned the body over with his foot. Yes, it was he, the same man who had captured near here four autumns ago, the man whose life he had spared because of his resemblance to the father of Marmaduke Van Swearingen, the man he had warned to leave this country and not return or he would be killed, the man who had promised to do so. Blue Jacket smiled grimly as he drew out his rifle and expertly scalped May. At his command, the other bodies were lifted out of the boat and dumped near May and also scalped. There were 23 rifles, kegs of gunpowder, and much other plunder in the boat. Most of this, except for the guns, they ordered the two white captives to pile in a clearing in the woods out of sight of the river. The canoe and rifles and the bodies, one by one, were also hidden in the brush. They had finished just in time, for far upstream, a warrior waved a signal that another boat was about to come around the bend. The Indians themselves hid, and once again, Peter Devine and David Thomas took their places on the shore. Chapter 28, Friday, November 1st, 1791. They were the great assemblage of chiefs. They were the greatest assemblage of chiefs ever to meet on the northwestern Ohio Territory. At the mouth of the Allglaze River, where it emptied into the Maumee, which in turn rushed northeastward towards Lake Erie, almost 3,000 Indians met in a grand council. Though the tribes represented often had had squabbles among themselves in the past, now they met, put aside their differences, and joined together to meet the greatest threat ever to face them. A great army had been formed under Governor General St. Clair at Fort Pitt. It had moved down the Spaleothipi, stopping to pick up volunteers at Wheeling, Point Pleasant, Marietta, and Maysville, as well as its headquarter fort, Fort Washington at Cincinnati. Its prime purpose was to crush Indian resistance and build a string of ports from Cincinnati to the Maumee River to keep the Indians under control. With artillery and horses and good weapons, along with the expectation of huge reinforcements and supplies to quickly follow, St. Clair had led his army out of Fort Washington. 23 miles from Cincinnati along the banks of the Great Miami River, St. Clair stopped to erect a new fort, which he named Fort Hamilton. On October 21st, 24 miles north of that site, he erected Fort Jefferson, but then he began to have troubles. He was, his was an army of malcontents, and during one night, fully 300 of them deserted. Fearful that they would meet and ransack the supply train to obtain rations, St. Clair sent his best force, the 1st Regiment, in pursuit, and then continued his march to the north with his remaining 920 men. He marched his army straight into the worst defeat in the history of his country. At their Auglaize River meeting, the Indians appealed to British representatives from Detroit to help them, not only with arms and ammunition, but with manpower. The British refused. They would provide arms, ammunition, and powder, yes. They would even provide some of the best Indian agents, men such as Simon Gurdy, Alexander McKee, and Matthew Elliott, dressed in Indian garb, of course, to act as advisors, but they could not afford to become openly involved. The Americans would not need much of an excuse to march against Detroit, and that important western fort must not fall to them. And so it was up to these assembled chiefs to select their battle commanders and pledge their warriors and meet this white army with such power and spirit as they had never witnessed before. The first problem to be settled was who would have command of the Indian forces. Again, it came down to a draw between Blue Jacket and Little Turtle, and once again they were chosen as equal commanders. After all, had they not severely defeated Harmar's army last year? Uh, the Crane, chief of the Wyandotte, would be third in command, and following him, Chief Pipe of the Delaware. Wapa Wakwa, White Loon, would lead the ways in a few Mohawks. Thus it went down the line through the Ottawas, the Mingos, the Pinkashaws and Eel River Miami, the Potawatomis and the Kashakakias and the Kickapoo and Chippewa and Winnebagos and others. The Indian force had moved southward at once and when St. Clair camped his army for the night on November 3rd at the headwaters of the Wabash River, he was unaware that hardly more than a mile away, 3,000 Indians were busily painting themselves and preparing their weapons for an attack in the morning. That came Friday, November 4th, a mean gray morning of bitter cold. Low, heavy clouds reflected ominous promise of the snow-covered landscape below. St. Clair appeared at front of his assembled troops, raised his arms, and spoke briefly. From intelligence delivered to me during the night, he said, I am led to believe that we will be attacked by the Indians today, perhaps very soon. All men will see to their weapons at once. Artillerymen will position and load the cannons. Emergency fortifications are to be erected beginning this moment. But the time for such measures was past. With fearful shrieks, an unbelievable horde of Indians sprang from cover all around them and charged. On a dozen fronts or more, led by Chiefs Blue Jacket, Little Turtle, Pipe, Wingenund, Blackbeard, uh, Chisuka, uh, Bakagalia, Black Hoof, Tarhe, Black Snake, Sun, White Loon, and others, the Indians struck terror into the hearts of the whites with their unexpected attack. Scarcely firing a shot, the forward guard detachment of St. Clair's army abruptly panicked, threw down its rifles, and ran for its life back towards the main encampment. 
The panic was contagious and spread over the whole army. And in an instant, the white force was in a deadly state of confusion. A hot fire from the first line momentarily checked the main Indian advance under Blue Jacket and Little Turtle, but an immediate return of withering fire caused staggering army losses. St. Clair screamed for the artillery to fire, but for some reason only two of the cannon went off and neither did serious damage. At once, Blue Jacket directed the greatest weight of Indian fire towards the artillery before they could collect themselves. In brief moments, virtually all the artillerymen were down, dead, or dying. Never before had such a fierce battle been waged in the Northwest Territory. A din of fierce screams and cries filled the air, and the snow-covered ground became a red sea of red slush stained with the blood of hundreds of men. Colonel John Gibson of the artillery tried desperately to rally his few remaining wind. Fight them, he shouted. Fight them. Don't show fear. True Virginians never show fear. I'd rather die 10,000 deaths than let these savages take the field. But he only died once. In that moment, he caught a bullet in his spine and was killed. More than any other Indian president, Blue Jacket seemed to be everywhere at once, rallying his own men, leading them to the hottest action entirely without fear or hesitation or seeming concerned even for his own welfare. He fought with fantastic energy, and soldiers fell before him with regularity. Within the first half hour, 14 fresh scalps were wadded together in his pouch. A regular army captain, Charles Van Swearingen, suddenly loomed and thrust a bayonet at him. The blade slit Blue Jacket's side, and instinctively the chief wheeled his backhanded tomahawk deep into the soldier's belly. The man fell upon his back, and Blue Jacket pounced on him, grasped his hair in one hand, and felt for his knife with the other. The soldier's eyes opened, and they widened in fear, and then to amazement as his gaze took on the features of the Indian chief. His gaze locked on the small white scar like an inverted V over the chief's right eyebrow, the scar that years ago when they were boys he had accidentally put there. Duke? He whispered hoarsely. Is it you, Duke? Don't you know me, Duke? It's, it's your brother, Char. Duke! His voice rose to a scream, Duke, I'm Charlie. He stiffened and then died, and his body relaxed. Blue Jacket stared into his dead brother's face. It was Charlie. A great roaring seemed to be sounding in his ears. No, he shook his head, no. He had no brothers but the Shawnee. With a flick of his knife, he lifted the scalp and then leapt away to continue the assault stuffing the hairpiece into his blouse and shrieking a cry that was more than a mere battle-lust cry. It was a cry that carried a deep inner pain. The slaughter of soldiers was tremendous everywhere. Many of the soldiers, paralyzed with fright, simply stood in one spot trembling and crying until downed by a bullet or tomahawk, knife, or war club. Nor was the slaughter limited just to the military. The army had been followed, as was custom, by hundreds of camp followers. Some of them were wise, but mostly they were loose women. Upon them, too, the Indians fell, and the slaughter here was great. Within a span of an hour, over 200 of them were killed. For the first time, St. Clair realized his army was doomed if it could not escape, and he shouted orders for retreat, but it was not an orderly withdrawal. At the sound of the order, the men cast aside their weapons and ran with all their strength to the rear. It was a complete and devastating rout. All the way back to Fort Jefferson, the army ran, walked, or stumbled as fast as his remaining could could travel. The tattered, bleeding remnants of the army began arriving at the fort around dusk, where they were met with the most welcome sight imaginable, the return of the powerful 1st Regiment, which had been unsuccessful in its search for the deserters. It was a solemn procession which slowly wove its way back to Fort Washington and Cincinnati. Their faces were gaunt and haunted, their eyes dazed and unseeing, their feet moving in a mechanical shuffle. There were no cheers and a few tears, and only stunned and stricken silence as the residents watched the ragged remains of the worst military defeat in the history of the United States. The statistics alone spoke volumes. 52 officers in the battle, 39 of whom had been killed and 7 wounded. Of the 868 regular soldiers and militiamen in the battle, 593 had been killed and 257 wounded. Of the 255 camp followers, 220 had been killed and all the rest wounded. The final grim totals were almost beyond belief. Of the 920 soldiers who fought on that battlefield, only 24 men returned uninjured, 264 were wounded, and 632 were killed. Taking into account the slaughtered camp followers, a final total of 852 whites had been slain. What made it even worse was the fact that almost 13 whites were killed to every Indian who died. Total losses for the Indian side were only 66 killed. It was the greatest victory the Indians had ever had in a battle with the white men. Chapter 29, Sunday, Saturday, December 31st, 1791. While the year ended on a more satisfactory note for the Indians in general, there was grief in a number of the Shawnee Wigiwas, as the brave warriors who had lost their lives in the victory of the Shamanese were mourned. Of the 66 Indians who had been killed, 20 had been Shawnee. The most peculiar form of mourning was that done by Chief Blue Jacket. 
Though he was now being heralded as one of the greatest war chiefs in the entire history of the Shawnee tribe, four weeks after the battle, he was silent and moody. It was a depression which not even a singular event could lift. That event occurred in the middle of the month when a deputation of British officers and soldiers marched to his village from Detroit. On behalf of the King of England, and with much pomp and ceremony, they heaped him with high praise, presented him with medals, and appointed him to the rank of Brigadier General of the British Army. Never before had such an honor come to any member of the Shawnee tribe. Yet even that failed to penetrate the gloom that had settled over Blue Jacket. A week after they were gone, with only a muttered phrase or two to Wabith, Blue Jacket rode out of the village and was gone for nearly two weeks. Alone, the Shawnee chief traveled to the southwest until he reached Rattlesnake Creek. He traced its course to where it emptied into Large Paint Creek, and then followed that water how course 30 miles downstream to where it in turn emptied into the Scioto River. He crossed this larger river at the first fording place and then rode downstream along its east bank until he reached its mouth at the Spaley with Epi. He saw boats filled with white immigrants going downstream to Manchester or Maysville or Cincinnati, but he avoided exposing himself and otherwise paid them little attention. At length he tied his horse in a long tether at the base of a great limestone cliff overlooking the big river. Expertly he climbed to that huge projecting shelf known as Hanging Rock. Along the way, he gathered an armload of sticks and tinder, and on the cold, bare surface of that ledge, he built a small fire. Until it was burning well, he merely squatted and gazed into the flames. Then, from a pouch hanging around his neck by a rawhide thong, he removed the sand-colored scalp of his younger brother, Charlie Vince Waringen. With his knife, he cut the hairpiece into small squares, and one by one pitched them into the fire, watching the hair singe and burn, and the skin portion curl and blacken into cinder on each one before tossing on another. While he did this, his voice rose and fell in an eerie, melancholy chant of the death song. It took more than an hour to finish, and when he was through, the fire had become low. With a little stick, he scattered it, and as a plume of white smoke drifted upward to the cold air, Blue Jacket resheathed his knife. Then he stood up, and with his arms crossed over his chest, looked out over the broad, dark spaley with Epi. He let his gaze follow the river upstream until the water disappeared from view. For a long time, he stood there, and in his mind, he was once again on that little creek bake in Virginia, twenty years ago, bartering himself to the Shawnee captivity for the life of his younger brother. How frightened Charlie had looked then, an expert for his size, how remarkably little he had changed in appearance over the years that had passed. When at last the cold air brought him out of the reverie, Blue Jacket turned away from the scene. A single tear glistened on each cheek, the first tears he had shed in many years. With his foot, he scuffed into space the dust and ashes of the remaining embers of the little fire, then he began the slow descent to where his horse was tied. He had loved Charlie very much. Chapter 30, Tuesday, December 31st, 1791. Another year had passed, and the situation between the whites and the Indians had not changed. The United States government now recognized, perhaps for the first time, that the Indians in the Northwest Territory were a force to be reckoned with. President George Washington preferred, if possible, to deal with the problem peacefully. He dispatched messengers with peace overtures to all the principal chiefs, asking that they hold a grand council and discuss peace with a new treaty to fa favorable to all. These overtures of the president came to nothing. In some cases, the Indians even refused to discuss possible negotiations, and in those cases where they did hear out Washington's emissaries, they were scornful of the proposals. What fools did the Shamanese think the Indians were? How many times in the past had they listened to such proposals? How many times had they agreed only to find themselves pushed farther back, their land taken, their game destroyed? Nor did it help the emissaries much when word came to the Indians in June that the Kentucky lands were no longer a part of Virginia. They had been made into a state named Kentucky and were now a part of the United States. As a result, the refusal to listen to the peace proposals was sometimes extreme. Some of the emissaries were even slain. Attacks on boats drifting down the Spaley with Thepe increased, and onslaughts against scattered settlements continued. Still, the government had hoped for a peaceful settlement. That hope was smashed less than a year later. A United States Army supply train of 100 mounted horsemen escorting a similar number of pack horses between Fort Jefferson and Fort Hamilton was attacked by Indians under Blue Jacket and Little Turtle. Fourteen soldiers were killed by the warriors. It was the last important attack of the year, and now President Washington knew the only solution lay in the use of force. He named one of the country's most able military leaders, General Anthony Wayne, to lead another campaign to crush Indian resistance. Because of the dauntless way the general led his men into the battle, he had been nicknamed Mad Anthony. Wayne was a shrewd, resourceful leader, and he had no intention of making the mistakes Generals Harmar and St. Clair had made. He formed his army and marched it in early winter to Fort Jefferson, but found the fort small and ill-fitted. So five miles north, he ordered the construction of a new fort, which he named Fort Greenville. Here the army would winter, and as soon as the weather became better, the campaign would begin in earnest. Wayne also sent a detachment to build another fort on the site of St. Clair's defeat, this fort to be named Fort Recovery. 
The detachment sent to do the job arrived there on Christmas Day and met a horrible sight. Skulls were strewn everywhere, and before they could lie down their tents they had pitched on the old battlefield, the scattered bones had to be scraped together and carried outside. The next day holes were dug and the bones remained above the ground were buried. This included no less than 600 skulls. Wayne's preparations for war did not keep him from continuing his efforts at establishing peace with the Indians, but as with George Washington's efforts, such messages were received with scorn, and in some cases the messengers did not even return. Both Indians and British worried about Wayne's preparations for war. Another great council of the Confederated tribes was held, and there was no doubt that the Indians were on the whole looking forward to the next battle. After all, had they not defeated Generals Harmar? Had they not virtually annihilated St. Clair's army? Why would they not be able to do so against Wayne as well, especially if Little Turtle and Blue Jacket should lead them? But for once, Little Turtle was hesitant. He did not think it wise to oppose Wayne and urged that the Confederacy try to reach some peaceful compromise with the Whites. The Whites were shocked to hear this from the great war chief of the Miami tribe, and several of the other chiefs accused Little Turtle of cowardice and becoming too old. Surprisingly, he did not take great offense at this. Instead, he raised his hands and spoke solemnly. We have beaten the enemy twice under separate commanders. We cannot expect the same good fortune always. The Americans are now led by a chief who never sleeps. Night and day are alike to him, and during all that time he has been watching uh, our villages. Notwithstanding the watchfulness of our young men, we have never been able to surprise Mad Anthony Wayne. There is something that whispers to me that it would be prudent to listen to his offers of peace. The discussions continued, but it was obvious that Little Turtle uh, did not want to fight. Uh, as chief of the Miami, he would not send his tr troop into battle. Uh, Unanimously, Blue Jacket, Brigadier General and War Chief of the Shawnee, was appointed Commander-in-Chief. It was an honor accepted, but his heart was not in it. Deep inside, he believed that Little Turtle was right this time, and since that day he had slain his own brother in battle. Something had not been quite the same with him. A certain drive and vitality had gone out. It was something he would never again feel.